Our next speaker is uh, Jeremy Flack. He is founder and president of Flack Steel. He has pre previously served as co-owner, president, and treasurer of Lawson Steel, where he managed the company's sales, sales per force, purchasing, and operations. In 2010, he divested his interest in Lawson and, stab and established his own company. Uh, prior to that, he was a CFO and treasurer of Encore Manufacturing in Cleveland, and he has a little bit of a bank background in banking as well. Jeremy. Thank you, David. In 1971, I was in diapers, so. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Platts for having Flax Steel today and giving me this opportunity to speak with you all. I think Platts does the best job in the industry of reporting uh, on changes and uh, news every day. Does an excellent job with the, the pricing and the website and we appreciate your support uh, as distribution. Also appreciate that the SBB Platts includes a, a significant panel on distribution because we are a major factor in the industry every day. We, a lot of these conferences, we start talking about raw materials and steel mills, but the largest buyer of flat rolled steel in North America is distribution community. So it's nice to see that we have an opportunity to represent our ideas and, and, and a platform. So I get really excited about doing this. Uh, I, I make a living in the trenches buying and selling steel every day. Not often I get an opportunity to speak about our business beyond rolling up my sleeves with some of you in this room. So some of you are familiar with, uh, with me and I get a little animated every now and then. So as we go along, bear with me, I get, I get excited. Uh, when, I get excited and I forget my next point. Brian, who I work with, told me I had to slow down because I tend to speak very quickly. But uh, in preparing my remarks for this, for this talk today, I started thinking about the business. As I'm, and I'm in the trenches doing the business every day, looking at flax steel, figuring out where we're headed, figuring out where the industry might be headed. And I realized that the service center business is a lot like a boxing match. I've boxed personally, and it's the only sport where you play offense and defense at the same time. So. I think I should rename my, my talk today. Uh, instead of taking stock of the year ahead, maybe we should uh, rename it Ali Frazier 4. The service center business for a minute is an industry that's in transition. Uh, we've seen large aggregators and consolidators take positions and buy service centers in the last several years. There's a growth in the toll processing um, network in our community. And most importantly though, there have been changes in buyer attitudes. And what we see is that buyers are, of, of flat rolled steel are increasingly interested in the financial architecture and their deals and less and less concerned with exactly how the material gets to their plant. The biggest opportunity that we see for the service center community and distribution in steel is financial architecture in the way that we sell our OEMs. So who is Flax Steel? We're not a typical service center. By design, we don't own, we don't own any equipment. On paper, we look like a bank. On the bottom side of the graph uh, up here, you see that the service centers really, we look at it as two businesses. We think it's bifurcated. You have those that are in the processing business and the buying and selling business, those that are just in the processing business, and a company like Flax Steel, which is just in the buying and selling business. So our vendors and our competitors continue to leverage themselves into processing, improving the distribution network that's out there. We see ourselves more, though, on the upper side of the, of, the, of the graph, which is structure. And by that, I mean coming up with ways to help our customers grow their businesses through the way that they buy steel. So we're like Southwest Airlines. You know, I don't know if you've all flown it, I'm sure. They don't, they don't assign seats. They don't own the air, airplanes. They don't own the airport, but they get people around where they're supposed to go. So it's a different business model. Uh, we've been called a broker, which we're not. We own, at this minute, a little too much steel. What drives the price for steel? Everybody's, there are a few people today with uh, philosophies on this. Our philosophy is that cash in the market and cash out of the market is what is driving the steel price today. I think distribution's driving the steel price. We have a lot of cash to deploy or deleverage with at any point in a market. So as we get information, and as we decide to commit our capital to steel, apparent demand flies way up over the real demand curve. And 
This is much, much different than 10 years ago when real demand and apparent demand were you know, basically the same and a $20 a ton move in the price was, was big news. This is how we see the volatility curve. Price gets to a low point, everybody piles in, load, backlog, the mills get busy, they start raising the price. Usually they tend to raise the price below, beyond where uh, it should be from a fair value standpoint because they've got good backlogs. And when I started in this business, I asked the guy who was my mentor, hey, how do the mills figure out the price? He said, it's very simple. When they have a good, good backlog, they raise the price. When they have a bad backlog, they lower the price. And really, not much has changed except those swings have become more and more and more extreme. So as the price goes up, over, I believe, $700 a ton, you start to have some friction. Friction for a few reasons. Uh, you have commercial credit starts to get a little tighter. You've got substitute products at high numbers, 800 and above. And then you've got the marginal uh, manufacturers who simply won't pass on, attempt to pass on a price increase to their customers. So they, they elect to wait it out, suck tons out of distribution as long as they possibly can. Lead times come back. Uh, mills have now run the price up well above cost, so they've got room to give. They cut the number, book tons, and then we have a vacuum on the other side. So this is what we're living on a daily basis. And tactically, what we've done is created flaxsteel.kai's next move might be. Uh-oh. Okay. This is free for now. <laughs> When I started the business, I, it was the first time I ever owned my own company, and I was supposed to be, uh, I'm going to be the boss, so when you're the boss, you get to tell people what to do, and I was going to tell someone to assemble all this information for me every day so that I could take a look at it when I got to the office and figure out where we might be headed. Also had to put a website together, so I decided to put all this information, put our view of the uh, important metrics for the steel market every day out online. What this, done, this has done is it's driven a lot of discipline in our company and also given us a lot of positive exposure because we've, we've put a stake in the ground that we are in this business. We may not own equipment, but we're very interested in the financial side of it. But what we do here is we, we publish a flax steel hot roll price, which is in the upper left hand section. Okay, good, that shows. That's old, uh, but I guess new again this morning or yesterday. We also have a mini mill uh, conversion cost, the, the estimate that we post what we like to do here is try to figure out how close the market might be getting to cost or how far diverging from it. We look at the price of steel around the world. We look at the NYMEX forward curve, capacity utilization numbers, raw materials from around the world, exchange rates. I like to look at the rebar price because I think that that rebar number and the forward curve in Turkey for scrap you know, tells us where our scrap price domestically might be in the coming months. Interest rates, freight rates, and we also uh, uh, combine some headlines. We aggregate headlines from the AMM, SBB, Steel Orbis, and the Financial Times. We also have a blog every Monday where we give our opinion about, from a very tactical, week-to-week -week basis, what we believe the market's doing. Now, why do we do this? Well, we do this because this is the place where we sit down with our mills, the place where we sit down with our customers every single day and talk about how do we get deals done. And yes, you have to ignore some market rumors to get deals done. So how do we do business? We look for liquidity, we look for points in the market where there are opportunities to buy and or uh, make deals. We, we want to know where the product trades. We also look for elasticity points. So this is going to get back to looking at flax steel. OK, you're a service center. And you're trying to figure out what to do with this whole picture that's out there with volatility up, down, price here, there. And how you play volatility, we, 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 we hedge some risk on the, on the forward market. We keep our inventories low. We look for points to get in and out. We try to mirror our buy and our sell so that we don't get upside down on steel. Because naturally, as a service center, we're long steel all the time. And we try to force discipline through our sales force, understanding how much our customers actually need. So are they speculating, perhaps? But the biggest issue here is this. And this is where I see our business, and my focus has changed a lot in the last six months. The opportunity in our industry as service centers is to provide guaranteed prices for our customers who manufacture product and or mirror their sell
to our cell. So figuring out how they go to market and sell their products and then mirroring their purchase of steel to that. That means getting heavily involved in the futures and forward market. I'm a big proponent of it. We're very involved in it. I sit down with customers. I talk to them about it all the time. We make a big presentation. We talk about the forward curve, show how we're going to hedge risk for them. And then they say, that's great. That looks fabulous. Quote me on 500 tons for next month. So we've still got a big disconnect out there. And uh, we are at the very beginning stages of what will we'll grow into the way that the service center industry runs itself in the next decade. Preston wanted me to discuss quickly uh, the leading markets uh, uh, for steel. These are familiar to everyone. The important issue here that I see is that we weren't talking about the energy business that much in our sector. We weren't talking about mining very much in our sector six years ago. The wonderful thing about steel and the wonderful thing about being in the distribution business for steel is you can move around. You can invest in these industries. You can put capital into these industries. And you can help them grow and help them grow their markets. Import, export, a lot of talk about this today. Quickly, I think there will be opportunities periodically during the next couple of years to buy, to buy imports to bring it into the US. It, it's going to be hit, miss, hit, miss, hit, miss as we, as we ride the volatility curve up and down. Once again, our industry is consolidating. I believe this will continue. I love the consolidation that's going on in our business because it provides more and more opportunities for flax steel to, to, uh, to have a role and to develop our business model further. The biggest challenge, I think, in the service center industry and probably the steel industry at large is attracting talent, attracting young, intelligent people to come work in our business. The steel industry's got a bad reputation of hiring people, letting people go, super cycles, rust belt. It's certainly not Facebook. And so the challenge is, how do we bring smart people into our business? How do we show them that this is a dynamic, growing, and solid industry? And that we're part, in Cleveland, Ohio, I sit at my desk every day, and I'm part of the global economy. It's interesting, and so we have to sell that. Oop, thank you. Appreciate it. This is how we do things at Flax Steel. This is the way we look at it. It's a bit different than everyone else, which is the point. So appreciate your time.